Check, check, one, two. Check, check, one, two. Walking around and talking. One, two. Oh, yep. Check, check, one, two. Check, check, one, two, one, two, check, check. One, two, three, four. Yeah, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four.
Check, check, one, two, check, check. 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 Yeah.
Check, check, one, two, check, check. This is the Q&A mic. Check, check, one, two. I'm going to turn it on as well. Check, check, one, two. 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 So there was a weird feedback on that when using it in the room. On the Q and A mic, like, like the, what it, like having this tape here was like causing it to do weird stuff in the room. I'll maybe tape it down a little longer, a little lower to kind of see if that will help. this real quick, sorry. All right, I'm gonna try it again. All right, let's see here. Weird. All right. All right, so it's having the road mic close to the Q&A mic is causing the feedback issues. So when it's off, it's fine, but as soon as the road mic's on, it creates a feedback issue in the room.
Stay away. Okay. I got it. It's in the middle. Alright, I'm gonna do a test again right now. Test, test, one, two, check, check, one, two, one, two, three, four, check, check. Can you hear me? Uh, I thought I was. Let's double check though. Yeah, it should be on either on the live stream. Yep, this is not me on the live stream. Uh, sure, yeah, I don't have an app on, so yeah. Yep. Yep. Starts at seven, right? Um, yeah. Check, check, one, two, check, check, one, two, one, two, check, check. Checking the Q&A microphone, check, check, one, two. Check, check, one, two, can you hear it? Check, check, one, two. Check, check, one, two. Check, check, one, two, one, two. Check, check, one, two, one, two, check.
Unplug the rose, the shotgun. if I should just do that one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's some before Let's see how how well this charged. All right, charged pretty quick. just on the tables, on the podium and on the table, so. Alright. Yeah. Check, check. Check, check, one, two, one, two, check, check. One, two, check, check. One, two, check, check. Yeah, one, two, check, check, one, two. How was that?
Okay. Great. Well, welcome everyone who's here in person. I think this is our 31st annual Ravenbrill uh, Holocaust lecture. Where we've been uh, bringing speakers, esteemed speakers from all over the country and all over the world. Um, and thank you for those who are live streaming with us, I think from all over the country and at times all over the world as well. Uh, I think we're really lucky to have the provost with us this evening. Let me quickly reduce, uh, introduce him and he's gonna make some opening remarks. Um, so Provost Thomas Yaitsko is a professor of economics who serves as the interim provost and executive vice president for academic affairs at Michigan State University. He transitioned into this role from serving as the senior associate provost overseeing the budgeting process of the Office of the Provost, Provost Office Communications and Events, Institutional Research and Institutional Space Planning and Management, as well as the Apple Developer Academy with MSU in Detroit and the Student Information System Transition Project. Um, he has a wealth of <laughs> uh, a huge resume with lots of publications, um, and he's also felt, uh, held faculty positions at Royal Holloway College, University of London, and Texas A&M and short appointments at Duke, Johns Hopkins, and Georgetown Universities, and at Humboldt University in Berlin, Germany. He's also worked at the US Department of Justice in Washington, DC as an economist in the antitrust division, where he was the lead economist on many investigations of mergers and potentially anti-competitive firm conduct. Um, he has advised and consulted for state attorneys general offices throughout the US, US concerning antitrust and consumer protection matters, and has been trained by the US Department of Justice as an expert. Um, and I think more personally, I'll just say that as interim uh, provost, uh, you have been very supportive. We've had meetings um, uh, with representatives of the Sterling Institute and very supportive um, of the work that we do. And I think the sign that you're taking, uh, you know, four hours out of your time this evening on relatively short notice um, shows your dedication um, to the subject matter and to the work that we do on campus, and we immensely appreciate it. So uh, thank you so much for making some opening, short opening remarks, and then we're going to actually recognize some students before, before the lecture. So thank you so much. Thank you, Yael. That was very kind of you. Uh, I'm excited to be here. It's a pleasure uh, uh, to join you all for the annual uh, Rebbein Grill uh, lecture uh, in person, uh, even so. Um, as mentioned, I'm, I'm Thomas Yachko. I serve as interim provost and executive vice president for academic affairs here at Michigan State University over the last uh, year and a half. Uh, and I'm very excited, actually, also uh, that we have Michael and Elaine Serling here, who are not only the uh, namesake of uh, our Jewish studies program, but also key partners in the collaborative work on behalf of our Spartan community. So thank you for all that you do uh, for, for us and for the university. Uh, the hallmark of the Serling Institute for Jewish Studies in Modern Israel is the close interaction of faculty, uh, students, and community members. And it is exactly in that context also that I had the pleasure and honor of getting to know Yale a little bit and, and uh, uh, seeking guidance from her and, and advice. Uh, and I think that more broadly, I think this is on uh, display, uh, full display here uh, with everyone participating in person or, or being virtual. Uh, tonight's lecture by the accomplished historian Alexandra uh, Garabini is an example of the mission of the Sterling Institute, uh, so, uh, which is to engage in the interdisciplinary study of the history, cultures, languages, identities, and religion of the Jewish people. And I'm intrigued to learn from Alexandra about how diaries can teach us more on the history of the Holocaust, knowing full well uh, how intimate a medium a diary uh, is and, and uh, from a period in, in history uh, when people are truly engaged in that in a manner that is perhaps uh, at least not widespread, if not, if not lost uh, largely. Uh, so I'm thankful to the daily work also of uh, Dr. Yale Aronoff, of course, and, and her colleagues who helped uh, put this annual lecture together. Um, and I'm grateful for the many academic co-sponsors of this program across MSU. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to Yale so we can also celebrate uh, our students.
I want to thank Dr. Amy Simon who organized you know, this lecture this evening. So maybe if Dr. Amy Simon and Yola Kedem and Mary uh, just first come, because um, we, we're basically going to be recognizing some students together. So if you come uh, join us and uh, up here, and I don't know if you want to uh, go first with, with Sydney. So I, is it that, do we have to go closer? Is that yeah. it? Okay. Yeah. So okay. sorry about okay. that. Yeah, okay. That so works. maybe maybe do that and you can adjust it. Yeah, it's also allowed. Okay. okay. All right. Um, so wonderful to see so many people here and particularly so many students. And so it's my great honor to begin the student awards um, for the um, Serling Institute Student Achievement Award. I do find that MSU, everything has lots of names. Um, I'm the William and Audrey Farber family endowed Jewish history, which took me about a year to learn. Um, so, um, so the Serling Institute Student Achievement Award, and um, myself and Professor Aronoff uh, nominated Sydney Bernstein, who is a current student in my senior seminar and who was a student in my anti-Semitism course last semester. And I just want to say a couple words about um, how wonderful she is and about the great work she's done in Jewish studies. Um, obviously, since I've had her in two classes, I've come to learn um, how deeply she engages with questions of Jewish studies in the classroom um, and how, how much she knows and how humble she is about how much she knows, but how she is also um, just a wonderful um, uh, citizen in the classroom who uh, can chime in when needed and, um, and, and always has something interesting and engaging to say. She's done amazing research projects, including, I won't go into it because it's really depressing, it's my Holocaust Studies senior seminar, but she presented even today in class and did an amazing presentation with original research into a topic um, that nobody's ever researched before, as far as we can really tell. Um, and aside from the great work she's done in my classrooms, she has also participated in our institute in many ways. Um, she's been the um, elected representative of the Jewish Studies minors. We have 40, 50-ish um, Jewish Studies minors, and um, in order to kind of see what they are doing and what they want and what they need from faculty, we have um, a student representative, and Sydney has been doing that for two years. And the, the best thing she did, I mean, she did a lot of great things, was recommend that, or somehow we got to, and she kind of recommended that we do a bake-off for uh, or faculty bake and students uh, 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 rate our bakings. And, but also, alongside um, uh, informational night about all of the amazing um, scholarships that we have in Jewish studies. So um, thank you for that. But she comes to all of the events and has been super involved in many of the lectures um, as well as took four semesters of Hebrew with Dr. Kedem and um, did our study abroad program at the he Hebrew University and won a whole bunch of our Jewish studies scholarships. So she has basically done everything and done it all outstandingly well. So congratulations to Sydney for the Student Achievement Award. Noah, do you have the certificates? Or, uh, that's what I, so we're going to give them. Right now, so each, uh, come up, come up. So uh, each of our students is getting a $500 award, and they are also getting a certificate, which they're about to uh, receive. So congratulations. Thank so you. Noah's bringing it. that we'd like to recognize. The next is Andrew Schulman, uh, who's really taken advantage of so many of the opportunities uh, that we've had to offer. Uh, he's a senior in James Madison College, majoring in social relations and policy, and minored in Jewish studies. Uh, he's taken advantage of uh, Dr. Kedem's uh, study abroad at the Hebrew University, uh, and interned at the Holocaust Museum in Budapest all through our scholarships. Um, and excelled in his uh, classes and, and has done an excellent job interning 
for three and a half years in the Serling Institute. He also took Hebrew um, to a two with Dr. Kedem, followed it up with two independent studies. One he conducted under the guidance of Dr. Kedem, a national con service conducted by some of Israel's Arab citizens, and another with Dr. Weiss, an Israeli culture through film. Uh, uh, this work was covered by our Levy and Finifter Hebrew scholarships. Uh, and then under Dr. Kedem's uh, guidance on his class on cultural diversity and immigration, he also um, uh, did work uh, and, and original research there. Um, uh, he also did an internship in Israel, supported by his scholarships with uh, Tourist Israel. He was able to attend numerous day tours and identify um, uh, significant areas for potential improvement. And then he was awarded the Eric and Deborah Abramson Scholarship that they endowed it in the honor of the Serlings um, that uh, supported his work in the Holocaust Museum of Budapest. And there he did research uh, and assisted in the preparation for an upcoming exhibit conducting on radio broadcasting in Hungary and media narratives of other major countries involved in the war mainly the US and the UK. And one major finding was that if the US media had better publicized their reliable information received from Europe, public opinion would have shifted earlier to create life-saving initiatives such as the War Refugee Board. He's been a fabulous intern with the Serling Institute for the last three and a half years, um, helping with dozens and dozens of lectures and films and helping to advertise those across the university, uh, attending sometimes community advisory board meetings, um, and helping with receptions and so many things. So uh, you're kind of uh, a model, also a Jewish studies minor and intern in the Sterling Institute and really appreciate all of your valuable work. Um, so yeah, come and catch <laughs> I just want to say thank you to Professor Aronoff, to Mr. and Mrs. Serling for everything you do for the Institute, uh, to all of the faculty. I've, I've really loved my time as a part of the Institute, as a Jewish studies minor. I'm very proud of the program, of what we've done, of our fellow students, and I really look forward to seeing all the initiatives down the line. Thank you. Hi, um, so it's a lot of fun to, you know, this is a challenging time uh, for all of us involved in Jewish studies and with Israel. And, in, uh, and uh, as you know, uh, Israel's, the situation in Israel is challenging. So it's a real pleasure to be able to celebrate here. All these three undergraduate students have done, I calculated today on average, uh, four and a third classes with me. <laughs> so, that's a pretty big number, and one of, the, one of the benefits of working in a very small program, like the Hebrew program here, is that I get to work with students uh, long term. All of these three students did research projects with me uh, as part of study abroad, and as part of independent studies, or as part of the Hebrew classes that they're taking with me. So I had the pleasure of learning from all three of them. Uh, I nominated uh, Lila Weintraub, who's taken Hebrew with me, four semesters of Hebrew with me, and has done the study abroad with me. Uh, she is a very vivacious person. She, uh, uh, she's laughing, but it's true. Uh, it's a lot of fun having her in the classroom. She's very participatory. Uh, she had the enormous pleasure of doing study abroad and having COVID at the beginning of the program, and she still managed to pull out a, an amazing research project which he presented at the Selling Institute annual um, research conference last year on languages in Israel. Uh, she looked at the status of Hebrew, of course, but also Arabic and English, uh, and the impact of the law of nationality that was passed in 2019, which basically downgraded Arabic from being an official language of the country to being a recognized language of the country. And she asked a lot of people in the street about their opinions. She also did a lot of uh, some reading on this, and she produced a really interesting uh, project. Um, and just to show you how uh, the diversity of kind of projects that people can do in, this pro in these programs, this semester, in her last semester here at MSU, she came back to taking Hebrew, and she's doing a research on the, she's doing a research project where she read an article in Hebrew about 
the significance that people give to the way that singers and dancers dress in their video clips for the Eurovision. So she has wide ranging interests, but also is very active in the Jewish studies program, also in Jewish life here. She's a leader of a Jewish uh, student organization on campus, uh, and she helped organize a workshop at Hillel that I gave on how to make burekas. For those who are very interested, I can send recipes. Uh, but she, um, she has been really involved in many, many aspects and has done things at an incredibly, incredibly high level but also uh, with depth and with caring for other students. Uh, and I think she merits this award with the, uh, as much respect as we can give a student here. Thank you. who know Steve Weiland will chuckle at a story um, about Steve having a bee in his bonnet about this person that he had talked with, Ruvain Margaret, and thought would be a great person to recruit into our doctoral program in the College of Education. And so we did. Um, and it has been such a pleasure for, I'm a uh, Mary Jeswick, I have a joint appointment in the Department of Teacher Education and the Department of English. And I work with uh, Ruvain in the context of my appointment in the teacher education program, uh, where he is a third year student in the curriculum instruction and teacher education doctoral program with the long names as you mentioned. Um, which we call the site program. Um, Ruvain recently passed his departmental comprehensive exams with a paper that integrated literature from general education and Jewish education. This effort has been central in his doctoral studies and it has proved challenging um, taking this path through our doctoral program, um, which takes as its mission to prepare students to be leading scholars and educators who deeply understand and work to improve education in its political, social, and cultural context. Unfortunately, however, the religious and ethno-religious aspects of education are not prominently part of coursework or the overall political, social, and cultural vision of most um, folks who are involved with our program. Um, so it has come to pass that Ruvain has had a rather hard road a hoe, so to speak, in studying issues of Jewish education, which he has been absolutely dogged about. Um, and um, I did some early work on Holocaust education early in my career, and so it's been really delightful to kind of learn with Rubain and, and kind of um, go into the Jewish educational literature, which has been new to me. So I feel like I've learned alongside and with and from Rubain. Um, and, and his studies. Um, Ruvain has distinguished himself through the literatures, as I said, he synthesizes in his scholarship, but also through empirical study of Jewish education, interviews, um, starting to work on classroom discourse research. Um, and he's beginning to share this work with the, with the field of Jewish education as well as the broader educational research community. Um, he presented last year at the American Educational Research Association. His, his work produced lively conversation and um, presented also this summer at the Network of Research on Jewish Education at Brandeis University, um, where I discovered, I was at the conference as well, that Ruvain had just really embedded himself as a, as a part of the conversation in this network of very distinguished scholars and educators. So it was fun to see that in action. Um, I will wrap up to say also, um, you know, Ruvain started the program with an already impressive, uh, he, he is a teacher, a Bible teacher, a Talmud teacher, um, and had written about his teaching. And so it's just been really delightful to see what 
you, Ruvain, has accomplished in the content in the context of the department that seems somewhat hostile at times to, to your perspectives and your Jewish identity, and especially within the last six months, as was alluded to. So for my part, I'm really, really excited about the prospects of the new understandings that Ruvain is already generating about Jewish education and more generally the role of religion within teacher education more generally. I have already learned so much from him. Congratulations. for our faculty who mentored these students, and that's really the focus of our program. So I know we're eager to get started as well, and I'm always thinking of pictures, so before you leave those students who got recognized, we need a picture of all of you uh, uh, after the program. So I want to introduce uh, my uh, fantastic colleague, Dr. Amy Simon. Um, she uh, herself uh, just had a recently published book uh, emotions in Yiddish Ghetto Diaries, Encountering uh, Persecutors and Questioning Humanity. So she's an expert on, on uh, diaries, and she brought in another esteemed scholar on the subject. She holds, as she said, the William and Audrey Farber family chair in Holocaust Studies and European Jewish, study, uh, 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 European Jewish History at MSU. Uh, she teaches at James Madison College in the History Department and is a vital core member of the Surly Institute. Um, she was a researcher at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., and she held a Leon Millman Memorial Fellowship for research there. Uh, she's worked on Holocaust fiction, memoirs, diaries, and pedagogy that has appeared in Holocaust Studies, a Journal of Culture and History, Jewish Historical Studies, the Journal of Jewish Identities, as a number of edited volumes, and she's also a fantastic teacher who was uh, awarded the 2022 MSU University-wide Teacher Scholar Award. So she uh, is responsible for organizing this, the lecture this evening, and um, she will be introducing our speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, it is indeed my great honor to introduce our speaker today. Um, we are here for our annual um, Raven Brill Holocaust Lecture, which started, um, as you can see in your program, in 1993 um, with the Raven Endowment and then added to that starting in 2014 with the Brill Endowment. And it really gives us the opportunity to invite the foremost scholars in the field of Holocaust studies um, whether it be you know history, literature, film, art, whatever discipline, just the people that are doing the most exciting work. Um, and so when I came here in 2016, I got to take on that role. It's one of the pleasures, great pleasures of my job. Um, so it was uh, endowed first um, by Professor Albert Rabin, who came to MSU in 1948 um, and retired in 1982, providing 34 years of service through teaching and research in psychology. And he um, established the endowment to commemorate the Holocaust in memory of his parents, David and Sarah Rabin. And um, Edward Brill established the Michael D. Brill Endowment Fund in 2014 to support teaching and research about the Holocaust to honor the memory of his brother. Uh, Michael was not able to attend college himself, but spent his life devoted to Judaism and learning about history, especially the Holocaust. So we are fortunate to have such generous um, alumni and donors and um, with that, I will turn to our invited speaker. Um, so Dr. Alejandra Garbarini, um, I, I'll read first and then I'll say a few personal notes as well. Um, she's professor of history and Jewish studies at Williams College. She's the author of Numbered Days, Diary Writing in the Holocaust from 2006 and co-author of Jewish Responses to Persecution, Volume 2, uh, 2011. And Number Days was a finalist for the prestigious National Jewish Book Award in the Holocaust category. She's also done many articles and reviews and co-edited two, um, um, a, a special issue of a, a French, <laughs> I do Yiddish, I do not do French, a French uh, journal and um, the diary, uh, is this another, yeah, a French edition of the Diary of Lucien Dreyfus. 
Um, and she's also co-authored Lessons and Legacies, Volume 8, New Approaches to Integrated History of the Holocaust from 2018. Um, I know she's working on uh, a new book now, so excited to see that as well. And her current research focuses on European Jewish and non-Jewish representations of mass violence in the decades prior to and during the Holocaust. Um, since spring 2003, she's taught at Williams College, where she offers courses um, on the history of Holocaust, European Jewish history, and modern European cultural and political history. Um, so I will say, so her book came out in 2006, and I started graduate school in 2004. Um, so her work was really enormously influential. The, the Number Days book was enormously influential to me as I was writing and figuring out how in the world to write a book about Holocaust diaries. And um, while my book and her book are very different, the models of kind of how to think about organization and how to think about methodology and how to make this into a narrative that made sense. Um, I, I went back to her book over and over uh, as a model. So I am, and then of course I met her a few times and she was really awesome. So that, that's always good when you meet your you know, intellectual uh, models and then they turn out to be nice people too. So I am more than thrilled to invite um, Dr. Alejandro Garbarini here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to make sure, can you, is it projecting? Okay, good. Um, it is, it's a pleasure, it's a tremendous honor to be here with you this evening. Um, I'm extremely grateful to Professor Amy Simon for inviting me, um, and also to Yael Aronoff and to all of the faculty here at MSU who are part of the work, really, of the Serling Institute for Jewish Studies in Modern Israel. Um, it's quite an honor to be giving the Rabin Brow uh, lecture tonight. Um, I also want to thank, I don't know, I don't think she's here, but I wanted to thank Stacy Hoxie, who handled all the arrangements for my talk. Um, and thanks to all of you for taking time out of your schedules to be here, and I think there might be people online as well, so thank you for tuning in, for being here this evening. So everyone wrote. That's what Emanuel Ringelblum recalled. He was a Polish Jewish historian. And he wrote a report in the Warsaw Ghetto that he composed in January 1943. This is a report that he hoped would reach his colleagues outside of Poland. Ringelblum was describing the Jewish population in Warsaw under German occupation. He used the past tense. Just a few months before, the majority of the Warsaw Ghetto's population, approximately 265,000 people of a total ghetto population at its height that exceeded 400,000 people. 265,000 people had been deported and murdered in Treblinka in a massive and brutal operation that was carried out by German SS, police units, and non-German auxiliaries. It was called at the time the Great Deportation. It stretched out over eight weeks in the summer and fall of 1942. Ringelblum was one of approximately 60,000 Jews who had evaded deportation at that time. In the aftermath of that event, with no end in sight, he took up the project of writing a history of Polish-Jewish relations during the years of the war during the preceding three years. It's a history that he was writing from memory. The documentation upon which his history was based, which included his own notes from the Warsaw Ghetto, this is the edition that first appeared in Yiddish of that work after the war. It included those notes, it included a treasure trove of other materials that had been produced and collected by Ringelblum and several dozen other people who worked with Ringelblum on a clandestine archive that was established in the ghetto. This archive at that time in January 1943 lay partially buried in boxes, in tin boxes, approximately 10 of them, under a school building in the site of the ghetto. 
the rest of the archive in two other tranches would be buried in, other, in two other sites after he wrote this report. Ringelbrun's lengthy report about what had happened in Warsaw, what had happened to Warsaw Jewry, highlighted the writing habits of Warsaw's Jews in the ghetto. So here we see his picture and the quote I'm about to read. Everyone wrote. Journalists and writers. That was only natural. But there were also school teachers, social workers, young people, even children. The majority wrote diaries in which daily events were reflected through the prism of personal experiences. A great deal was written, but the largest part by far was destroyed along with the end of Warsaw Jewry in the deportation. You see here Ringelblum calling attention to the fact that the murder of the Jewish population of Warsaw was accompanied by the loss of their diaries. As the person who had spearheaded the creation of the clandestine archive, Oinig Shabbos it was called, Ringelblum was acutely aware of the significance of this documentation and he felt deeply the pain of its destruction along with the destruction of his community. In Vilna, too, the practice of diary writing and the conditions in which Jewish residents of Vilna kept diaries, conditions that were hardly conducive to writing, attracted the attention of a Yiddish poet, of the Yiddish poet, Avraham Sutzkever. Sutzkever described how he had observed, quote, the teacher, Turbovich, sitting on a pile of stones, writing in a small notebook. He was keeping a diary, unquote. When Sutzkever observed this scene, it was a September day in 1941. It was shortly after the Germans had carried out mass shootings of Vilna Jews at the nearby killing site at the Ponary Forest. And they had established a ghetto in two parts to confine the remaining Jewish inhabitants of the city. At a later date in the Vilna ghetto, as the Jewish population of the ghetto continued to suffer the fate of forced labor, hunger and disease, periodic roundups and mass shootings, Sutzkever would salvage a different man's diary, not Turbovich's, someone else's, a diary, we don't know the name of who the diarist was, but Sutzkever recorded that it was a diary written in the sewers. Sutzkever included excerpts of that diary in the memoir that he wrote after the war about his experiences in the Vilna ghetto. And this is the edition, the cover of the edition of that memoir that recently came out in English. Beyond the ghettos of Warsaw and Vilna, in cities, in towns, in villages across Eastern and Central and Western Europe, in hiding places, in concentration camps, in transit camps, even in Auschwitz-Birkenau, Jews kept diaries. Some wrote for the first time. Others who had had a prior habit of diary writing now made the experiences of Jews under German occupation the subject of their literary production. Pictured here are pages from a diary kept by a man named Lucien Dreyfus. He was living in Nice in France and he's an example of such a person, a person who had a long-standing habit of diary writing, but whose diary writing fundamentally changed during the war. And he continued writing this diary up to the eve of his deportation from Nice, first to Drancy, to the transit camp outside of Paris, and from there, with his wife, they were deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau, from which they never returned, where they were killed upon arrival. Of course, Jews produced other types of literature. They produced literature about the events that they were living through in other forms. They wrote songs, they wrote poems, they wrote short stories and plays and reportages, memoirs, folklore, rabbinic responsa. There's even a novel that, some, that someone composed in the Warsaw Ghetto that was recently analyzed by a, a scholar. But as Ringelblum indicated, diary writing was distinct from these other forms of literary production. It was more accessible as a literary form. It was popular among people of different ages and cultural linguistic backgrounds. Diaries reflected the perspective of the diarist on the occurrences that were happening to them 
and around them. So my talk today considers a phenomenon which developed among Jewish adults and youth and children across Europe during the Holocaust under particular and varying conditions. Rather than analyze a small number of texts which can be interpreted and reinterpreted, and which in a way I was thinking as I was preparing this talk is really what everyone here can do, can bring to this topic, that maybe you've already read diaries, maybe you plan to, but you will encounter them or you have encountered them. My focus here is to provide you with an overview of diary writing, to give you in a sense a kind of way of thinking, contextualizing those texts that you can encounter on your own. To reveal what the perspectives of their writers, the victims, consisted of. A consideration of diary writing necessarily connects to the cultural and social and even political history of the Holocaust. And in the last decade or so, new readings of Jewish diaries, along with the publication of new editions of diaries in multiple languages, have contributed to the writing of new histories of the Holocaust. My goal then is to give you a sense of diary writing as a cultural phenomenon with a history and of how diaries have informed the writing of Holocaust history over the post-war decades. I also want to, and this may be something that's uh, a little bit of a, of a kind of suggestion without something I'm going to follow through in the text, but I also want to suggest that a consideration of one type of literary production and, and its history seems all the more critical in the present moment, the moment we are living through. We are engaging daily in conversations about misinformation. We are engaging daily in conversations about new technologies that generate writing. And it's all the more critical that we ask questions, questions about how sources of information are produced, by whom, under what circumstances. How can we read them? How should we read sources critically as we try to reconstruct events and experiences and popular opinion? So as I seek tonight to elucidate the history of Holocaust diary writing and the history of historians' use of Holocaust diaries, I hope you will also think about the wider questions to which this history relates. Questions like, how do we know what we know? And what are the sources of knowledge production in our contemporary world? So first, to the history of diary writing as it has connected to historians' work. So prior to the 1990s and the early 2000s, historians of the Holocaust disregarded Jewish diaries, aside from a privileged few. It may astonish you to hear that. It may astonish you to hear that Anne Frank's diary was not among those privileged few. Anne Frank's diary was translated into dozens of languages. It attracted readers the world over. Nevertheless, historians did not attribute great historical insight to the diary. In 1971, Renata Lecour-Weiss, who was herself a Holocaust survivor and a wartime diarist, wrote a literary studies dissertation at New York University at NYU. And she, it was a, a dissertation about concentration camp diaries. But her work remained unpublished. Well into the 1980s, West German historians continued to question the historical value of Jewish sources in toto. And meanwhile, in opposition to West German historians, Jewish historians who were producing scholarship in different languages and with academic appointments in different countries accorded importance to victim testimony against West German historians' dismissal of it. But nevertheless, they still upheld a distinction, a distinction between texts that were documentary in character and those that were too personal they thereby eliminated from historical consideration the majority of Holocaust diaries. The diaries to which Jewish historians routinely turned in the early post-war decades 
were those that had been written by Jewish men who had held positions of communal responsibility or leadership during the war. The diaries of Emanuel Ringelblum, whose diary I showed you had been published early on. The diaries of Adam Chernyakov, who was the head of the Warsaw Jewish Council. The diary of Avraham Tori from the Kovno Ghetto, who served as secretary of that Jewish Council. These were recognized as valuable sources. Now, this was in part due to the stature of their authors, but it wasn't the only reason. Compared to victim testimonies that were recorded post-war, historians considered such diaries more trustworthy. These were unmediated by memory and the reframing of the past that was incurred by retrospective knowledge. These texts presumed reliability also stemmed from their affect. They seemed more objective. They were less emotive. So this significance that was accorded diaries by historians has changed. It's changed in just the last two decades. Holocaust historians now approach the reading of diaries from new theoretical vantage points, and they do so also out of new areas of historical interest. Feminist and critical theories and post-colonial theories have made visible the ties between the circulation of power in society and in politics and the attribution of authority in discursive fields. Just as now it is widely recognized that the documents that are produced by colonial administrators and by states are no more objective than those that are produced by colonial subjects and citizens and the oppressed by states, the same can be said for the Nazi documents in comparison with the accounts produced by Jews. Furthermore, increasing attention to gender and social relations among victims has generated new interest in diaries, in diaries that were written by people who lacked social capital, what Professor Amy Simon refers to as the world of the non-privileged victims. Thus, by the early 21st century, diaries have begun to attract widespread historiographical attention. Saul Friedlander incorporated Jewish diaries into the second volume of his magnum opus, Nazi Germany and the Jews, which won a Pulitzer in 2008. And Friedlander made conspicuous use of diaries in that work. They were a source for the study of Jewish life during the years of extermination. But even more significantly than a source for the study of Jewish life, he talked about using diaries as a means of disrupting his readers' complacency, trying to provoke their continued emotional engagement with a history that he worried by the time of his writing had become too familiar. Subsequent to Friedlander's work, historiographical attention to new topics, topics such as gender and sexuality, microhistory, everyday life, the history of emotions, has brought renewed interest to the gamut of diaries that Emanuel Ringelblum had flagged for future readers in his wartime report. Recent works by historians use diaries, but they use them often in conjunction with letters, with memoirs, with testimonies, to reconstruct Jewish daily life and social relations, including Jews' experiences in hiding, Jews' flight from the Nazis as refugees, and the particular experiences of children these are all topics that have really emerged in the scholarship since the turn of the 21st century. And even works of history that focus on perpetrators and on different European populations' responses to and participation in Nazi genocidal policies increasingly integrate evidence from Jewish diaries into their source base. So to give one example, the publication in the 1990s of Victor Klemperer's diary, which was written in Dresden and spanned the entirety of the Third Reich, this reopened the question of public opinion. It reopened the question of the ideological commitments of ordinary Germans. It reopened what did they and other populations know about the Holocaust. Sources of Jewish provenance are no longer regarded as more limited as more subjective, as less trustworthy, 
than other types of documents, including Nazi bureaucratic documents. For diaries, no less than for other types of sources, Holocaust historians' methods of source criticism have gained in sophistication. Historians now pay attention to semantic and narrative elements, context, and the biography of their authors. Diaries shed light on aspects of Jewish victims' experiences that historians previously overlooked or found too sensitive to broach. Until the 2010s, historians relegated to the margin certain topics that belied the generalized desire to represent Jews in, in ennobling terms. These included topics that ran counter to normative ideas about gender and sexuality. Yet, as Zoe Waxman has argued, representing people, quote, who merely did what they had to do to survive has the effect not to demonize them, but to attempt to present a more rounded picture of responses to extreme suffering, unquote. Historians lately show an increased willingness to examine the beliefs, the mentality, the dynamics of Jews in different situations and locations during the war. Quote, to observe with an empathetic eye and then ask what it means as the historian Anna Haikova enjoins and enacts in her own work on the ghetto Theresienstadt. Historians are therefore reading diaries with new questions in mind. At the same time that diaries have become more prominent source materials in research on the Holocaust, scholars have also begun to point out the limitations of diaries. Strikingly, the limitations they point out now are not the same ones that concerned a previous generation of historians. Historians had earlier assumed that people wrote about aspects of their experiences in their diaries that survivors later avoided. And it turns out that diarists themselves rarely touched on certain sensitive topics, particularly experiences that defied their own gendered expectations about behaviors that they perceived as appropriate. Silences exist in diaries around things like same-sex sexual relations, prostitution and sexual violence, infanticide. These remain practically unbroken silences in diaries. And only since the late 1980s did some survivors begin to speak and write about such occurrences. The literary scholar Sarah Horowitz refers to these as deferred narratives. It turns out that survivor accounts recorded decades after the war are not rife with inaccuracies, as previously believed. Indeed, Sarah Horowitz summarizes that, quote, later accounts rarely diverge from the records set by earlier accounts. This is quite a surprising thing, actually. But they add detail and gendered nuance and they delve into topics that were for a long time kept out of the master narrative of the Shoah, unquote. Thus, this entire notion of the unreliability of retrospective sources relative to those contemporaneously produced has been subject to important rethinking. Diaries also do more than open a window onto Jewish daily life during the Holocaust. Diaries have themselves become a subject of cultural historical analysis, and also by scholars in other fields, not just historians, including literary studies and trauma studies and refugee studies. More than a source of affecting anecdotes, more than just authentic expressions of the inner life of their authors, diaries make possible the analysis of Jewish victims trying to cope with the effects of trauma as it was unfolding. Diary writers were often the subject of their writing. In Anne Friedman's words, diaries convey, quote, a history lived as experience by the person engaged in writing the account, unquote. Or as Amos Goldberg brings to light, and I put this up because it's a complicated quote, Holocaust diaries served as tools to start working through the trauma even as it was happening. Through writing, the authors reorganize their individual identities 
and weave the traumatic event in a preliminary fashion into the fabric of their lives, unquote. Scholars in recent years have thus engaged in analyzing diaries as a process as well as a product. So Jewish diary writing opens a window onto the cultural, social, and political history of the Holocaust. Most of all, it reveals the perspectives of their writers, the Holocaust victims. In and through their diaries, Jews' meaning-making efforts come into focus. And after all, it is the meaning-making practices of human culture, past and present, which constitute the central focus of the humanities. I'm turning now to the question of genre. Because any discussion of diary writing raises this question. What constitutes a diary? And furthermore, when diaries contribute to our understanding of the Holocaust, what is it that they contribute that's distinct from other sources representing the perspectives of victims? Several characteristics distinguish diaries from Jewish survivors' retrospective accounts. The connection in a diary between time and self is one defining feature of the genre. It sets diaries apart from Jewish testimony that was produced after the war's end. Diarists wrote without knowing if they would survive the war, nor did they know precisely what the fate of their communities would be, nor did they know what the fate of the Jewish people as a whole would be. Diary writers recorded their individual stories, but not only, not only their individual stories, and sometimes, like in the case of Ringelblum, for example, not even principally their own stories. In other words, Jewish diarists recorded entries about themselves, but they also recorded stories that they heard from people around them and news of the outside world. In sum, diaries are composed of discontinuous entries that portray events that had not yet come to an end. Out of this unknowability of the future on an individual and a collective level, many diarists invested their writing with public significance. As Jews struggled with their individual and communal suffering, many also wrote diaries out of a perception that their persecution had world historical significance. Diary writing became an instrument for navigating their encounter with history, layered onto the more widely recognized function of the genre to navigate the expectation of privacy. Yet I also want to mention that the Holocaust diary didn't emerge sui generis. It wasn't a unique Jewish cultural practice. The connection that Jewish victims made between diary writing and documenting history was not unique to Jews nor to the context of the Holocaust. Diary writing was an established cultural practice among Europeans in the interwar and war years. By the late 19th century, diary writing had become a recognized literary genre that was reinforced in various ways. It was reinforced pedagogically Diary writing was incorporated into school curricula as a means of teaching children writing. Technologically, diary writing was a standardized practice through the production and sale of bound journals with blank pages. Culturally, with the publication of famous and ordinary people's diaries, diary writing had become a literary form that people read as well as a practice that they emulated. What's more, the link between writing a diary and bearing witness to world historical events was cemented already. It was cemented with the soldier writer of World War I. Soldier writers became global figures. There was a boom in war books that straddled the world. In interwar Poland, autobiographical essay contests became a popular genre. These encouraged simple people to share their stories as an invaluable source of sociological knowledge and also as a way of trying to intervene in wider policy debates. The Yiddish Scientific Institute in Vilna 
which was, is known as the acronym YIVO, which was established in Vilna in 1925. YIVO launched its own essay contests, connecting autobiography with world events in the 1930s, and they actually held three separate contests. They called for Jewish youth whose lives had been marked by the political and economic dislocations of World War I and its aftermath to write about themselves and send in their autobiographies. Those contests yielded several, 600 plus entries and some people just voluntarily along with their autobiographies sent in other texts that they had composed including parts of their diaries. During World War II, the association of diary writing with national identity and with international politics was further bolstered when some states actually appealed to their citizens to document their everyday experiences during wartime. So for example, we know that Anne Frank actually was moved to begin editing her diary for publication. She, intent, she was looking forward to the publication of her diary after she heard a radio broadcast by the Dutch government in exile in London that was broadcast in Amsterdam, and it called on the Dutch to preserve their diaries and letters. After the war, more than 2,000 Dutch people donated diaries to the National Office for the History of the Netherlands in wartime, and they can still be consulted at the NIAD in Amsterdam today. Thus, European Jews turned to diary writing during the Holocaust was part of, and we need to see it as part of, this widespread cultural phenomenon with roots that extended back in time that captured the attention of adults and youth alike. Though hardly unique, therefore, to European Jews, diary writing took on particular significance in the context of the genocide that was being carried out against them. Prior episodes of mass violence and genocide in the era of World War I, including the Armenian Genocide and pogroms against Jews during the Russian Civil War, had demonstrated the importance of eyewitness accounts for subsequent justice-seeking efforts. During the years of the Second World War, many European Jews connected their diary writing to such earlier documentation strategies. When surviving the Nazi onslaught became increasingly unlikely, Jewish diarists attributed to their diaries the power to bear witness when they were no longer alive. To cite one example, that of Hermann Kruk. He maintained his diary writing from the start of the war in Warsaw, and then when he moved to Vilna, to the Vilna ghetto, he kept writing. And until the day before he was massacred in a forced labor camp in Estonia, he kept writing. He intended for his diary entries to accompany the extensive German and Jewish documentation that he was collecting. And in a poem that he composed in Yiddish that was recorded and recovered with the final segment of his voluminous writings, he gave voice to the hope that the diary he was leaving behind would reach future readers. For future generations, I leave it as a trace and let it remain though I must die here and let it show what I could not live to tell. Diary writing came to mean something different for individual Jews struggling with their own impending murder and the death of the Jewish people and their culture. Diaries were a genre with a history, but the Holocaust changed that history, transforming the function and meaning of diaries in the process. For the final part of my talk, what I turn now to is a discussion of the different meanings that Jews ascribed to diary writing during the Holocaust. We find that diary writing took on a range of meanings depending on factors that related to many things. It related to the biographies of diaries, the biographies of diarists, and also to people's different wartime circumstances. Even for individuals who had kept diaries prior to the Nazi era, the meaning of diary writing changed as their personal circumstances worsened and as the situation for Jewish populations in different parts of Europe deteriorated. Physical and emotional conditions made diary writing difficult to sustain despite 
the widespread recognition among Jews of its importance in the face of genocide. So we tend to think of diary writing as a means of creating distance from other people, as a means by an individual of carving out a kind of private space for reflection. Paradoxically, many Jewish diarists during the Holocaust came to envision diary writing not as a means of privacy, creating privacy, but as a form of connection with family and community members. For kinder transport children living without their families in group homes in France, for example, diary writing became a collective practice that created a bond to other children. As one German Jewish teenager wrote in the diary that she kept living in one of those group homes, quote, just now I am sitting with three, Helga, Edith, and I, and all of us are writing in our diaries. We just spoke about the diaries and when we can show them, maybe when we're all grown up, unquote. For some parents whose children had emigrated, or for couples where one partner had emigrated, diary entries took the form of letters that they were no longer free to send. One such example is the Dutch Jewish woman, Miriam Bola. Throughout 1943 and 1944, she carried on writing an account of her daily life, first in Amsterdam, then in Westerbork, and eventually in Bergen-Belsen. She wrote entries that were addressed to her fiance, who was in Palestine. She repeatedly expressed her worry that her account was not doing justice to subjects that defy description. But she persisted out of her awareness that she would forget the details if she waited to write. And also because her writing, she said, helped keep her fiance present in her mind. In other cases, parents who doubted that they would survive to be reunited with their children wrote diaries. They wrote diaries to communicate their love and also to impart information that they thought their children after the war might need to have. Jews also kept diaries as a means of connecting to unknown readers in the outside world. Such a connection only existed in their minds and it would take place in a time frame that remained unspecified. Jews who kept diaries in the context of East European ghettos and camps and in hiding, people like Hermann Kruk, who could no longer trust in their own survival or in the survival of the Jewish communities whose destruction they were witnessing, they imagined that their diaries would be read in the future by strangers. Heike Klinger addressed her diary to future readers. I am writing these words to you, she wrote, as she tried to fulfill the mission with which she was entrusted by her comrades in the Jewish fighting organization in Vangin, in the part of Silesia in Poland that had been incorporated into the Third Reich. The mission with which she was entrusted was to go into hiding. This was her mission and document for posterity the history of the Jewish uprisings. Similar to diarists who address themselves to loved ones, Jews with no direct knowledge of the genocide, excuse me, Jews with direct knowledge of the genocide wrote to convey experiences that they feared the free world might otherwise not learn about or might not believe or might not be capable of understanding. Diary writing was one of Jews' very few possible means of expression under German occupation. Contributors to an underground Jewish newspaper in France wrote in an article that, quote, to have to remain silent before degenerate sadists without being able to cry out our disgust is one aspect of the torture, unquote, to which they were subject at the hands of the Nazis. For Jewish journalists in different countries in Europe, being cut off from public speech for a direct link to their diary writing. The journalist Jacques Bielinki began to keep a diary in the summer of 1940 in Paris under German occupation when his career writing for the French Jewish press was interrupted. Elsewhere in France, Lucien Dreyfus, who I mentioned earlier, made his diary a repository for the types of opinion pieces that he had previously published as the editor of an Alsatian Jewish weekly newspaper and he also recorded a running commentary on his daily life in Nice, where he sought refuge 
after the introduction of anti-Jewish laws, which caused him to lose his position as a teacher. In the Lodz ghetto in Poland, Józef Zelkowicz parlayed his experience as a journalist into a position in the archive department that was established by Chaim Ramkowski, head of the ghetto's Jewish council. But alongside that, Zelkovich, alongside those contributions Zelkovich made to the official chronicle, Zelkovich kept a diary in which he gave voice to incidents and viewpoints that would otherwise be censored. In Warsaw, another former journalist and cultural critic, Reichel Auerbach, was drawn into the work of Ringelblum's clandestine archive, and she kept a diary as part of her reportage. The Dutch Jewish journalist Philip Mechanicus considered his diary writing in the Westerbork ghetto transit camp as a form of deferred reportage. He wrote, quote, I feel as if I am an official reporter giving an account of a shipwreck. I write for those in a time to come. I write for those who in a time to come will want to get an idea of what went on here, unquote. His diary also served as an expression of protest against the silence of the people sent away on transports from Westerbork and never heard from again. Mechanicus wrote, quote, where are you, you thousands and tens of thousands who have been carried away from one place to another? What has been your fate? You are silent because they will not let you speak, unquote. The imposition of silence and the impossibility of protest transformed some Jewish writers into diary writers as they sought to break that silence. In the midst of genocide, what we might think of as a mundane reason or as mundane reasons for keeping a diary, such as to relieve boredom, took on fundamentally new meanings. And the arguably more profound reason for keeping a diary as a form of self-encounter also underwent a radical transformation. A teenager keeping a diary to pass the time in normal life circumstances bears only the shadow of a resemblance to Melania Weissenberg writing a diary to pass the time in a hiding situation in which she faced unremitting exposure to hunger and cold and darkness and vermin and emotional abuse for over two years. She herself described the contents of her diary as, quote, rather frightening, unquote. And with time, she wrote less and less frequently as it became an extension of her trauma, an extension of her boredom rather than a relief. Moreover, long-term diarists like Victor Klemper in Dresden, like Chaim Kaplan in the Warsaw Ghetto, as well as first-time diarists like Ellen Baer in Paris, and Eddie Hilism in Amsterdam. They struggled to find in diary writing a connection with the familiar self, the self whose identity and categories of meaning were not defined any by the Nazis. Diary writing served a critical psychological function for Jews as they tried to survive and make sense of the different kinds of violence and destruction and loss to which they were subject. Yet as the historian Amos Goldberg has, tells us, diary writing did not, quote, cure the radical disintegration of trauma that is expressed and felt in every page that was written during its overwhelming occurrence, unquote. Genocidal violence, in other words, changed the therapeutic potential of diary writing. Jews stopped writing diaries when they could no longer sustain the effort due to an emotional crisis, as well as the physical conditions and perceptions of risk. Diary writing, after all, required paper. It required a writing implement. It required the privacy to write, and it required a secure place to stash one's writing. Sometimes Melania Weissenberg was not able to write because her hands were too cold. In Theresienstadt, Anna Haikova tells us that, quote, the very hungry and weak stopped keeping diaries altogether. The representation of those close to death comes almost exclusively from the perspective of others, of those who were better off, unquote. In concentration camps, those inmates who could write diaries were in privileged positions relative to other inmates. And in the extermination camps and on death marches, almost no one kept a diary. 
the diaries that have been salvaged serve as an index of the diaries that were discontinued, destroyed, and never begun. In sum, and in conclusion, the primary meanings that diary writing took on for Jews during the Holocaust were an expression of protest or resistance. They were a form of communication with the outside world, and they were an encounter with the self. Diary writers often conceived of their entries in terms of documentation. They wrote to record for other Jews and for the world the truth about Nazi crimes. They envisioned different forms of post-war justice-seeking efforts, from criminal trials to restitution claims to works of history. Diarists wrote to defend a moral framework different from the Nazis to help guarantee, as one diarist put it, that, quote, the Nazi system and any other form of fascism disappear from the soul of nations, unquote. Most fundamentally, they wrote to assert the fact of their existence and to shape the memory of Jewish people and Jewish culture in opposition to the Nazi campaign to murder them. Those who addressed themselves to future readers challenged them challenge us to consider our responsibility in the face of the catastrophes in our contemporary world that continue to confront us. For historians of the Holocaust, diaries reveal Jews as victims, but also as agents of that history. Diary writing may not have been a universal phenomenon. Some segments of the Jewish population were hardly represented among diary writers many dimensions of Jews' experiences were left unrecorded. Diaries are nonetheless a significant cultural phenomenon in which, and by means of which, Jews tried to make sense of their persecution and mass murder. Diaries constitute a crucial part of the Holocaust's history and of the historiography of the Holocaust. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Please. Um, Will you introduce yourself to? Uh, uh, Lauren Harris. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for convening us. Um, you, uh, uh, I, I'm curious to know whether, so far as you can tell, uh, there have been um, diaries that have only recently been discovered. And if so, uh, does that suggest that there are still other diaries out there uh, that are hidden, that are forgotten, that are? remain to be found. I was just thinking that. So the question, thank you for that question. The question is whether um, there are recently diaries that have been discovered, what that suggests about the possibility for discovering other diaries that, have, that still are out there have yet to be found. It, it makes me think immediately, um, actually just issued in the last couple of weeks by um, an archive in Paris um, that's part of the Holocaust Memorial in Paris and Museum. They just issued a call for diaries, a call to collect. Um, and it's, it's striking because when I started doing work on diaries, it was back in 1999. Um, for my dissertation, and at that time, the first thing I needed to do was figure out where diaries were. Um, and to figure that out, of course, required writing to many different archives. What's really striking from 1999 to the present is how many more diaries have now been deposited in archives, um, including at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, also in Paris prior to this call for collecting diaries um, at Yad Vashem and at, at many other places. So absolutely, yes, there are diaries that have been sort of surfacing. Um, and I think one has to imagine that there are still more, although I think um, given the kind of generational moment, um, my, I would imagine that 10 years from now, it's unlikely that there will be some some large number of that will be newly discovered. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. 
So thank you for coming to Michigan State. Thank you, Professor Gardner and Garbarini, for coming to Michigan State to present the 2024 uh, Raven Grill Lecture of Stanford. So I have a question that goes back maybe 60 years or more when I was a young man, and I read several novels by a popular American novelist by the name of Leon Ernest. Yes. And some of his novels were, uh, became movies. Uh, the, the movie Exodus was from his, and I, I think The Source mm -hmm. might have been one of his books. And he wrote a lesser known novel called Mila or Mila 18. Yes, about and, the uprising. And most of them were fictional stories, but yet that was an address of a street in the Warsaw ghetto. And I'm wondering, and the, the goal of the, or, or the plot of the book was getting a writing out to tell the story of the ghetto because, the Warsaw ghetto, because the thought was that nobody would survive, nobody would get out. And they desperately wanted to have some record of it, which you spoke about tonight. Was there any truth to that title or to Mila 18 address? of any of the of, of diary writers that you spoke of this evening. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. It's funny, I've never, I've never read that novel, that particular one of Urus's, but um, indeed that address is highly significant. Um, it was one of the locations of the, um, of the Jewish fighting organization in the ghetto. Um, so the uprising in April of 43, um, it, is, it was one of the headquarters. Um, and so, yes, it is an address of great historical significance. And the fact of Urus's calling out attention to the, the kind of desire to, the need to, the urgency to that, that, that people involved in the uprising in the ghetto felt to get some kind of word out I think is very much reflected in, for example, you know, that, that diarist Klinger, Heike Klinger's work recording the story of the Jewish resistance um, and the idea that it was important for her just not to continue to participate, but that in participating in the resistance, that one form of participation was actually sitting and recording a chronicle about their activities. It speaks to, I think, something that has really been, um, in the last 20 years, a kind of radical rethinking of the significance of these kinds of diaries and other documentation projects. And the rethinking is this. After the war, for a long time, historians saw cultural resistance and armed resistance as two separate categories or kind of activities with which Jews were engaged. And there was a kind of hierarchization of armed resistance with cultural resistance often even being subject to critique as a sign that those who were engaged in cultural resistance did not, in a sense, understand the genocide that they faced and were responding with a pen instead of with arms. The radical kind of rethinking in the last 20 years has been exactly this to show actually the connections between, first of all, people who were engaged in armed resistance having also seen themselves the critical dimension of cultural resistance as a way of preserving something that they could no longer preserve their own lives and stories that they were not gonna be able to tell themselves. Um, and also, there's a kind of radical rethinking that cultural resistance has been subject to as itself a, a very important part of, of what it means to resist a genocide, is to actually, in some ways, contribute to controlling the narrative. And if memory serves me, part of the novel was about how to hide the diaries because they anticipated that everything would either be destroyed or that discovered and destroyed, burned. And so part of the novel was where to hide them and how to hide them. 
I wonder, without knowing whether Urs had at that time um, read about the Ringelblum's project about the Oinig Shabbos archive, because that's certainly what it must have been a reference to. He must have read about it, but I, I don't know. Thank you for mentioning that novel, because I, I'm thinking also, I don't know what year it was published, but it's early. I think in the late 50s. It's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. First off, thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, my name is Brock. Um, so I was wondering, with current events and what's going on right now, I know in the beginning of this lecture you talked about how um, it took a long time before these topics that were really serious and kind of taboo in a way weren't really able to be discussed through the writings because it was so serious and so personal. With current events, do you see this possibly uh, kind of repeating with if we find any type of writings from survivors of the Nova Festival or hostages, how do you think this could repeat or hopefully not repeat in the future with the types of knowledge we know now for what we had before? Thank you, Brooke. Thank you. Um, so I see the moment, I, I, I guess I would point to, there are continuities and discontinuities across this period of time from this past to, the, to our present. Um, there is no question that there are still topics that are, if not entirely taboo, certainly much more difficult to talk about and to write about and to receive an audience for. Um, at the same time, the way in which those taboos exist in the present tense is not the same as they did then. Um, and the, the extent to which actually many narratives have come out and reach us um, doesn't mean that they don't continue to be difficult narratives and narratives that remain, um, let's say, not simply that, that, are, that are contested in ways that um, suggest everything about how difficult those narratives are for people to listen to and hear, and um, that doesn't suggest anything about the veracity of those narratives. But I do think that we are living in a different time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Will you be in charge of calling yes, people? Yes, I'll hold the microphone okay. around. Any other questions? Thank you. My name is Griffin Powers. I want to thank you so much for this lecture. Thank you. Um, what particular segments of Jews have been left out of the record if they can be members? What was the question? What particular segments of Jews have been left out of the record if they can be given a category? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, what particular segments of Jews have been left out? I would point out two in particular. Um, one is that there are very few, practically no, but not none, um, writings by, um, by East European Orthodox which, it, Jews, um, which is, of course, the majority um, of Jews at that time um, in Eastern Europe. And, um, and second is situational, that there are situations, as I mentioned, in which people did not write. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for coming. My name is Sydney. Sydney, thank for you. Class, I recently read Anne Frank's diary and in the diary, we notably see expressions of joy and love, happiness, laughter, um, and I guess that's what makes the diary so popular, but I'm curious if those same emotions also exist in other diaries. Hmm. Certainly in some, yes, and in some entries, yes, certainly. Um, and it depends 
obviously on the person's situation. It depends on the person's temperament. And it also depends, something that Professor Simon and I were discussing earlier today at lunch, it depends very much on change over time. I mean, that there are, there are, there are diaries in which you find, at certain points, expressions of um, um, articulations of shared moments um, of friendship, of joy. Eddie Helism's diary, um, her entries in Amsterdam before she was deported to Westerbork, for example, um, contain remarkable expressions of her spiritual kind of faith, of her hope. The entries from Westerbork are different. So in that sense, I would say yes, certainly. And then you need to, in a sense, be attuned to the, the when in the diary, the situation of the diarist. And also the, the fact that part of what makes these such interesting texts is that the diarists are writing over time. Yeah. Hi, I'm Deanne Desimone, and I'm an, actually a studio artist. A little bit of a context, though. I teach a study abroad course in Austria called Music, Art, and Culture. We bring the students to Dachau, and one thing you've taught me is how to pronounce Eddie Hill, I call it Hillsome, Elisum. I have for years had the students read that diary, because as you so wisely pointed out, as she encounters herself, and I think that diary to respond has an yes, amazing to Sydney, yeah. amount of faith philosophy growing up, discussing her issues. She learns more in those two years or three years than most people learn, even if they live till they're 98. So I two questions. One is, um, has anything else been found by her? other than apparently there were more, there was more writings and she had another part of the diary that they had not recovered, as far as I know. Mm. And then a second question is just for a name. Um, we look at Prisoner of Paradise, do you know that movie which focuses on Kurt Geron in um, Theresienstadt, mm -hmm. he was, you probably know him. He was with Marlene Dietrich. Mm -hmm. He was a very famous, he was known for Mac the Knife, yeah. is how he made his name. And he made the film for the Nazis and Tracy and Stott. So we talk a lot about responsibility of the artist. And you mentioned Anna. Hi, Kova. Could you spell that for me? Of course. Because I'd love to have them read. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for those who are interested, um, this is a book by a historian. The book is called The Last Ghetto, and the historian is named Anna Haikova. She's originally, she's Czech, and her last name is spelled H-A-J-K-O-V-A. -A. Um, it's a book I, I can't recommend more highly. Um, with respect to Helism and other texts, you know, it's other than the letters which were p translated and published with the diary, I'm not aware of others. And I, I will now that you mention this, um, that you are aware of having heard that there were other parts of her diary that were found. I'll look into it. Thank you for mentioning well, it. Was that, that book published by a historian at Princeton is the only one that I've ever seen. But it's great that, thank you so much for your lecture because cultural resistance is so important. When I first started doing this in about 2006, oh my gosh, the negative comments about her yes. in the diary just blew my mind. Yes. So thank you for the work you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. Uh, Hi. My name is Leela. Leela. And 
Um, you talked a little bit about the use of diaries in conjunction, conjunction with um, radio and newspaper to recreate events. Mm -hmm. Have there been any instances where diaries that had either not been found or discarded, as you said, some tended to be, um, ended up reshaping or rethinking how events actually took place or if they, or what events that may have been forgotten have been brought to light because of these diaries? What an interesting question. Um, that's one of those questions where in my head what I'm thinking is, Absolutely, and then to come up with the example um, is, is more challenging. I mean, this, is, this doesn't feel like a satisfying answer but because I mentioned it, but I'll say it anyway because it's the only thing that came to my mind immediately, and that is Victor Klemperer's diary. Um, when that diary surfaced and historians started to read um, his observations and also what's remarkable in Klemperer's diary is the extent to which he also records things he overheard, um, conversations he's had. It fundamentally altered, it really opened up a completely different understanding of German society under the Nazis in the 1930s and war years. So I would say that um, that uh, that is an, that's maybe the example kind of par excellence, but um, there are others, but I'm, I'm standing here before you unable to, to, to come up with them. Thank you. Thank you. So, can I ask a question? Of course. Hold the microphone. <laughs> uh, so, a couple of questions. So first, since diaries tend to speak about what, was just, what has just happened mm -hmm. uh, in, in most cases, uh, and you did mention that some of these people wrote because they wanted to tell the world about what was happening to them. They had this kind of awareness. Um, there's two questions that come to mind. A, how much erasure do you see in what they write? So do, they, do you see them writing, rewriting? some phrases, rewriting some words, or are they just basically spilling onto the page and uh, maybe never returning to it? Mm -hmm. And how much reference do you see to when they write to previous writings that they've done? So they say, oh, I wrote about this event, but now I understand it differently, or I, this happened a week ago, but I never got to write about it, or something like that. Totally fascinating. Um, Erasure is a very interesting question because, of course, erasure can also be omission. Um, it seems to me that when diaries are, let's say, triangulated, um, in other words, when we bring diaries together with other sources, um, that it is quite striking how diarists would talk about some things and not talk about other things. Um, that could be, so one of the very interesting, I guess I would say, approaches to diaries in the last 10, 15 years has been to bring, when possible, to bring a diary together, let's say, if possible with, if a person survived, with memoirs or with testimonies or both that were recorded after the war. So very interesting to relate and compare the ways in which a person wrote at the time, obviously at a different age, contemporaneously, with, as I mentioned, this lack of, you know, without knowing the end, and then retrospectively what it is and in what ways that person then reconstructs the past. Um, part of what, you know, really does, you know, as I touched on, what part of what emerges later often are that there are things that um, it seems that people were fearful of putting in writing out of the possibility that what they put in writing could be discovered. So one issue around omission was certainly the risk, the risk of the, risk of, um, of the danger that they were bringing to themselves, to their loved ones, um, that would necessitate, in a sense, their silences around certain, around certain topics and around certain aspects of their lives. Also, subsequently, 
there are things that emerge in the kind of history of the Holocaust that then have become kind of central topics, keywords, and themes such that memoirs and also testimonies might focus on things that at the time people either didn't focus on or in a sense couldn't put together in the way that thanks to reading about the Holocaust later, they could then connect and relate their own experiences to other experiences and the sort of wider history about which they read. So these are a couple of examples, I guess I would say, of how to think about <clears throat> omission and, and um, that's different than the topic of rewriting. So the rewriting topic is very interesting. I mean, the Anne Frank case is obviously a, a very well-known one because I mean, part of the complexity of all the different editions that have emerged of Anne Frank's diary over the years also I mean, connects as well to her father's role as an editor. It connects to many things, but it connects as well to the fact that there are different versions of Anne Frank's diary that she herself produced. So that is an example of rewriting. It's not the only one. Um, and so part of the, the kind of question of rewriting also emerges out of the question of you know, whether a person was moving maybe their diary into a different format, um, as was the case, not frequently the case, but there are a couple of other cases of, of, such, you know, of such work that someone did during the war itself. Um, a piece of the, the reference to earlier writing that really struck me when I was working on my dissertation and, and then the, my first book that came out of that was the way in which some diarists at a certain point start to themselves engage in writing memoir during the war. So that there is a, a kind of a text that ends up being a hybrid, what I've called a hybrid text, where there's actually this contemporaneous production of entries alongside a retrospective account. The retrospective account that I found in, in a small handful of texts goes back to the original, like to the, the war. So imagine it's a person in hiding in 1943 who's been keeping a diary and then starts to write their account retrospectively of 1939 to 1943. And so that is not exactly a rewriting, but it is a very interesting kind of attempt to create some kind of a narrative that's different from that of individual entries. So that's maybe an, an unusual example of a kind of rewriting. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Matt. Um, so I, I, the first is a comment that it strikes me that there's a certain category of people who never wrote diaries, right? And uh, paradoxically, to write a diary, you have to have some period of survivability, right? So there's yes. a whole category of people who were killed in the Holocaust who never had an opportunity to write a diary because they were executed soon after being uh, arrested by an occupying German or Romanian authorities in the occupied Soviet Union, so I think that's worth underscoring. And then I guess my question is really about the yes. topic of your talk, which is the diary as genre. So we tend to think of diaries as an expression of self. Mm -hmm. And yet, to me, you know, diary writers who were writing for posterity, um, there's a sort of disassociation that begins to happen. I would assume, as the writing proceeds. So do you see that in your study, this sort of, um, uh, where the diary itself kind of acquires a subjectivity of its own? Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I very much appreciate um, your first comment about people who never wrote diaries. Um, and with respect to the genre question, um, I mean, part of what is, I think, really striking to me in the, the kind of this, let's say, this category of diaries and why 
it has been so useful and important for me to think about the diary in terms of its relationship to time and its relationship to change over time over and against what has been more traditionally the, the conception of diary as defining a type of literary production in which the writer is relating to themselves in a certain way is because it seems to me that, first of all, in this, let's say, group of texts, um, in this kind of amorphous group of texts, often the diaries that I encountered change. So I guess what I would say is um, disassociation, if, if what you mean by that is, does it appear increasingly that in these diaries, the diarist disassociates from themselves, from their own sort of self-observation. Um, I wouldn't say in what, that that's a change in one direction. Um, I would say that um, for some diarists, that is never the 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 focus on self is is not present at all. In Ringelblum's notes. I mean, when I first sat down to do this work, I remember having a conversation with my dissertation advisor, who's Saul Friedlander, about Ringelblum. And I said, well, I'm not going to work on Ringelblum because it's not a diary. And he sort of pushed back on my wanting to draw this boundary that excluded Ringelblum because of the ways in which Ringelblum's notes capture this sense of kind of daily observation and um, and so it generated for me having to think about well what would be a more capacious understanding of diary do I want to continue to argue my defend my position or do I think that there is some other validity um, to the uh, to the incorporation of these other kinds of texts um, but there are texts like Lucien Dreyfus um, which I, um, I brought out in, in an English edition a couple years ago and originally in a French edition. Um, it's a very interesting diary because Dreyfus was a diary writer prior to the war who never wrote about himself in his diary. He kept track of his views on what he read. He wrote about books. He wrote about his views on politics. But there was no everyday life dimension to his diary. When he's a refugee in Nice from his native Strasbourg, all of a sudden his diary becomes predominantly a text about himself, about his himself, his feelings, his thoughts, his community, his interactions. So I, I guess I would say that I think there's a lot of movement in these texts, and um, that's part of what makes them fascinating and challenging, um, and part of why they defy, I think, easy categorization. As far as you know, have there been any studies of the uh, diaries kept by uh, Germans uh, who were not uh, caught up in the Holocaust? Uh, I ask because uh, we know that the Nazis did not uh, invent anti-Semitism. It was endemic in Germany for centuries. Uh, and I, I'm curious to know what uh, um, German citizens were writing about uh, at the same time. Yes. Um, one of probably my favorite works of history that I've ever read, um, and I'm having one of those, is, is by a historian named Peter Fritsche. Um, and now I'm forgetting the title, so I guess that means I've definitely entered a certain stage of my life. But um, I w it will come back to me. But in this work of Fritsche's, um, it's not one of his recent books. It's a book that's probably 15 years old. Um, he analyzes diaries written by Germans um, in the Third Reich. And they're diaries that um, are written by, you know, they're diaries that essentially he found in the archives. It's an incredible book. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much.
and for the Sterlings to see um, all the Tornophilia faculty here, the Sterlings, and, and folks, if we all could take a picture together, I'd really appreciate before you go out.